Hey everybody, it's Doug here. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to a playthrough of one of my old classic favorites. This is Darkest Night, by uh, designed by Jer Jeremy Leonard and was produced by the once proud Victory Point Games. And is, this is the second edition of the game and is one of my favorite games uh, of all time that I've played, the uh, cooperative games that I've played. It is such a thematically fun and interesting game with simple mechanics yet deep gameplay and uh, it had been a while since I threw up a classic to the table the last one was um, I think the uh, um, let me see I think it was a touch of evil the 10th anniversary edition now this has been out for a while in fact I, if you like this game a lot it's probably gonna be really hard to get a copy of it um, it is not available anymore that I'm aware of and uh, you might be able to find some Secondhand copies. I'm not sure. Anyway, if you haven't seen Darkest Night, uh, you're in for a bit of a treat. If you have and you can't get it, but you like watching uh, when I do a playthrough of it, then please enjoy. Uh, I'm going to do a full game. Um, I'll try and uh, narrow it because I do a lot of uh, talking throughout the game. It develops a great narrative as you go. Um, and there's so many. See all of these, by the way. All these, little, except for this one right here. All these are different characters you can play in the game. It's pretty amazing. But I do have some special things. I'll just I'll just open it up right now and show it to you so you can see how this goes. I these are actually the perfect things that you need to uh, store your blights and that in the game. And what are blights? Well, if you'll see that through the playthrough if you watch and you haven't seen it before. But simply these two, I think they're uh, Chessex trays. See, are everything I need here for the blights. Oh, they're all in there, ready to go. You just take them out. Um, and the way these open up is pretty neat. You just uh, pop them open here. And I don't want to have everything because they're, they're kind of pop closed so you can store them well and things don't fall out, right? But if you open it up correctly, like I just almost almost did, I lost a few tokens there. Gonna put them back real quick. Um, and then you just flip these over, then you don't have to do anything else with it. You just put it out. So that is ready to go. And we're going to do the same thing with this one. Sure makes setup of this game super, super fast and easy uh, for uh, Darkest Night. And again, this is probably one of my favorite games of uh, all time that I play cooperatively. And it's a, it's a bit of a long game, so it's not something that if, you know, hey, I'm going to pop in and play this for 40 minutes and be done. It's not that game. Uh, the board is also versatile, depending on your space. So this board here is the board that you would use if you don't have a lot of space. However, and you also, if you do, this is the board that you get to use here. And this is the one that we'll be using uh, because we, in fact, do have the space. Now you see the board's not really that, I mean, it's not crazy, right? You got a track down here for your, what they call darkness and also clues and things like that. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, and you have the different areas of the region of the map where you, you know the monastery, village, mountains, forest, uh, ruins, um, the swamp, and the castle. Now, what's interesting about this world is in this game world, the good guys lost. They lost a while back, and now they're mounting a one final battle against the necromancer who has taken over the world to see if they can defeat him before the last bastion of hope, the monastery is snuffed out and the, the good powers, the gods that fuel the, the powers of our heroes, and you'll, you'll see what that means in a minute as well, if you haven't played, uh, uh, they are, the, that's the, this is it. This is the last place where they can be protected and, and be safe. And if we can slay the necromancer, then we get to turn the tide and reclaim the world from the terrible blights and beasts and creatures that have uh, befallen the world because of the necromancer. So I'm gonna get the board out, get that set up, and then show you the inside of the box. So this is the rule book. It's a pretty good rule book. Um, I don't need to look at it very often anymore, even though I will sh I'll surely make some mistakes because it's my nature. And when I'm doing cooperative games, I tend to make a few mistakes. Uh, but uh, there's also a compendium that shows you and basically gives you some story elements too about every character, what those characters' capabilities, what their specialties are. It's really, really cool, guys. I'm telling you, this is a, if you can get a copy of this game, I cannot recommend it enough. Um, and then, of course, there's a, a, a couple a really nice cheat sheet that shows you a summary of what all the Blights do, summary of the special items you can get in the game, and the turn order, 
we'll have that out on a regular basis. And then you see all this stuff. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in here, right? Lots of cards, lots and lots of cards. There's also a box of miniatures. I tend to use the standees because I like them. I think the color artwork on the standees is really cool. And the miniatures were okay. This is, for example, the Necromancer miniature. He's your big bad guy. Uh, he's pretty, uh, pretty powerful. Now, um, here are all of the cards. There's, wait, there's one for the Necromancer in here somewhere. We'll find that one. But anyway, these are all the cards for the characters that you're going to play. And in this game, each character that you... So there, it's always a four-player game. Now, there's some variants in this version of it where you can play less or you can play with five players. But I tend to like the game the way it's designed to be played, which is with four players, right? And this also has expansions in it. Artifacts, mysteries, things like that that came in expansions later. It's all built into the second edition. But each character is going to have a set, a deck of skills. And they're going to start with a couple of skills that they can use. Uh, so really, your player card is nothing but two things. One, it, well, on one side it's a turn tracker. So if you take a character, you just grab one that's not in the game, and then you can get a turn order, gameplay turn order. But all it really shows you is the symbol, the picture, a little descriptor, and your grace and your secrecy. Very important stats and where they mark for the, that particular character. The rest of it's in your skill cards, right? So um, when you're trying to uh, do something, you're going to be using one of those skill cards. There's various types that allow you to do a bunch of different things. Um, and I mean, it's really quite a wide variety. And I have some favorite characters, but I'm going to randomize it up. I'm not going to play the same characters I always play. I like to do random ones because I've played so many. I just uh, I want to um, play some different ones. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to do that part in just a little bit, but I wanted to show you some of the cool cards that you have. So there's a couple of different things, and I'm going to start with the artifact cards because those are going to go into a, a little holding pile for myself. We're, we're gonna, we will use them, but these are tarot-sized cards. They're really nice finish, and each one of these has that you can get, and there's a bunch of them. And here's the cool thing about this game, the replay value. Amazing! Because throughout the course of an entire game, You'll be lucky if you see a handful of these, two or three of them in the game. And there is a big stack, and they do a bunch of different things. I think the most I've ever seen is three. Uh, I'm sure that you can, uh, I'm sure that there can be more out in the game, but I've never seen that happen. It's really rare, okay? And then this is a really major deck. This is the map deck, and this deck tells you a number of things. Uh, what type of treasure you're gonna draw if you search an area and you're successful. Uh, could be anything from clues, could be from, uh, skill or equipment caches, um, items, uh, that's a skill book, for example, and different things that you can get, uh, like some different items that you can get that will help you along your way. Uh, on top of those artifacts, there are items, like little items, that, like one-use items, things like that that you can use. Again, massive replay ability. Okay, so this is the map deck, and again, it's on big tarot size things, and you'll see a lot of the map cards as we go, so I'm just going to put those aside as well. And then uh, this is <laughs> the other part that is really amazing. This whole thing are the events that we're going to be ta having happen during the game, and there's a lot of them. And again, uh, throughout the game, now, now you do tend to run through quite a bit of this deck, but there's such a variety, by the time you circle around, you kind of forget um, what your... Uh, what you're actually uh, running, what you've run through. Uh, there's so much stuff to it that it, it's really pretty easy to forget about it and just feel like the next one's pretty fresh. Okay, so anyway, that's the event deck, and that stays out too because that gets used quite a bit. And you can see the tray inside is really well designed to store everything. Now, most of this stuff, dice, of course, most of this stuff here are, there's like the little bag of artifacts, and, or not artifacts, but little items, and then these are keys and... Um, uh, why am I blanking out? Uh, uh, tokens, but I'm not going to remember what kind of tokens there. Um, not focus tokens, what I'm looking at. Um, I will figure it out. I don't know why I just blanked out on that. I will remember it as we go. But there are little tokens that allow you to enhance your um, ability. And these are time tokens for the quests in that that you'll see. I haven't gotten to that yet part yet. Yes, there's also quests. But these are the, there's the necromancer. And then these are the standees. They're really nice, big standees for your characters. Okay. And so then there's this deck. There's two more decks in here that are important. Or three, rather. Where's the other ones? Yeah, here they are. All three decks are in here. Okay. So 
This is the Mysteries deck, and these are mysteries that you can get that allow you to gain certain benefits. Ultimately, it's what unlocks your ability. So, in the old version of this game, you were trying to get gather four relics. And if you look on the map board, you can still play that way, where you get you can get there and get the relic. There's a lot of problems with getting relics. <laughs> and um, um, when you have them too early, the Necromancer just basically hunts you down and beats on you. But uh, these... They added an element to getting the relics, which is really incredible, which were clues first, and then mysteries. And these mystery cards come out instead of keys to unlock the relic, box to get the relic, these mysteries come out. And these mysteries are, again, a wide variety of things that, that come out on the board that you can accomplish. And when you accomplish them, you will get clues and sometimes special things. And it tells you where these belong. This, this goes in the mountains when they come out. Um, and then also there's some t sometimes some benefits that allow you to get to extra clues. So if you get enough clues in the game, it's 10. If you get enough clues, and you can see it's marked on the board actually. I'm not sure if you can see that, but that little cross sign reads, when you get there, you can cash in and get a relic. Do it again, you can cash in and get another relic. By that time, if you're actually trying to accomplish getting three or four relics, you're probably going to get killed anyway, but it's still pretty cool. All right. So anyway, uh, those mysteries are going to come out during the game. They're really fascinating. I'm not going to spoil any of them for you now. But then I'm going to talk about the next set of cards that we have. This is the Darkness deck. Now this was, again, something that came out of an expansion from the first edition where uh, the, the Necromancer was pretty basic. He moved around, he threw out Blights, and that was it. Blah, blah, blah. Now, once again, this is a pretty thick deck, right? You're only, at most, going to see a couple of these, maybe three, at most in a game. So imagine there's a deck of, I don't know how many it is, 50, I don't know, 30, 50 of these, and you're, you may see three of them come out. And they enhance the Necromancer, so he's not the same every time, right? He's always going to be different. And when he reaches certain thresholds, when the darkness level reaches certain, certain thresholds, remember, we're at the end of the world. We're at the last moment where the darkness is about to overtake everything, and the Necromancer is about to hit the peak of his power. And if we can uh, stop him before the darkness in the world just totally envelops the rest of everything remaining, then we win. And, but at the same time, he's still getting more powerful, so he gets these darkness cards. And these darkness cards have special abilities. Again, I'm not going to spoil any of them for you. And then last but not least, we have these cool sets of cards. What are these? These are quest cards. Now, another element to the game that was added, again, once they added all this stuff to the game, that's when it became one of the best games I own. Uh, because... None of them added a level of, like, uh, comp complication, but added complexity and fun to the game and a, and a greater element of storytelling, which is so important to me in these types of narrative, uh, like, uh, um, cooperative games where you've got a deep story. So these quests allow you to do certain things. They give you rewards, and they have, they're timed. See that? That's time. And you have to get a certain amount of successes on the quest to be able to achieve it and then you're going to get the reward. However, if you fail to get the reward and it expires, something bad happens. In this case, the darkness track would increase. And so uh, you're, we're going to be taking on these quests as well. Seem complicated? It's really not. Very smooth system um, because the turns are so simple. I mean, basically, on your character's turn, you're going to do one of two things. You're going to move or take an action. And the action usually consists of using one of your powers. Like maybe destroying a blight, or using a power or an ability on another player, or doing something like that. There's some other things you can do. You can go back to the monastery and and uh, rest up and heal and get some of your grace back. Grace is effectively your life, but I even like the, the play on that. It's different. Um, and I'll, oh, by the way, these things are called sparks. I remembered what they were just now. Okay, sparks. Sparks are like rerolls type items, things like that. They're really cool. But... Uh, Anyway, what I was saying is when you, uh, you, there's certain other abilities you can do, things you can do. You can hide, which get, increases your secrecy. Uh, you can go back to the monastery and try and heal. Grace, so you only have, your character only actually has one life to live, right? He gets killed, he's killed. He, she. But here's the cool thing. In the game, you're being protected by the last, the, by God, basically. And God is, is focused around this last uh, monastery of uh, last bastion of power and trying to help the heroes. So when a hero loses their life, what they actually do is spend some of the grace that the gods have given them. 
instead. And now I know thematically, I mean, basically it's hit points. It feels like it, it doesn't feel like hit points, so it feels different. And you don't ever have that many of them, and it feels like an important resource, uh, which makes it a heck of a lot of fun. And it, get, it makes the game tight and tense. I, I rarely get to the game easy, and even when I win, I feel like I might lose. And that's another cool, cool thing about the game that I love, right? So in this, uh, in this episode, we're just going to, I wanted to talk about the game and tell you a little bit about it, tell you a little bit about the mechanics and get our characters out, figure out how we're going to play. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a set of characters at random, and I'm going to ask you guys in, at the end of this to chime in and tell me which of the, I'm going to probably draw, I'll draw six of them, okay? Um, and I'm going to ask you which ones you want me to play of those six. I'm just, we're just going to do it at random, okay? And out of those ones, we'll play those characters. So this, this particular video is not going to be long. I'm basically using the time to set up a, a little bit of the game to talk to you about the game. <laughs> so we're going to get to that uh, in just a second. But let's, uh, let's next up, we're going to draw the characters. Now, if you, if you don't know the game, it doesn't matter. You still help me choose because um, I want you to pick something that sounds like it'd be fun for you to watch. Like if there's a particular character, and I'll talk about them a little bit before we play. So... Here's the big deck. I'm just shuffling it up. These, well, it's not really a deck. They're player mats, but you get the idea. I'm going to shuffle them all up, and I'm going to draw. Cut it again. I'm going to draw first one. The Paragon. So, the Paragon. The Paragon is an embodiment of virtue who lives his ideals. Able to energize and inspire others by his mere presence. He is a pillar and a beacon to his allies and a terror to his foes. His aura... Uh, strengthen nearby his auras, strengthen nearby our allies, and lend his actions a special flair. Nonetheless, virtue is a fragile thing and requires constant care and nurture in order to blossom. So that's going to be the first possible character, the Paragon, like kind of like a paladin almost, but also a good support character who can help other characters out a lot. Okay, the Enchanter. All right, so this is. Uh, kind of a magic user. You can see they've got crystals floating around her. The enchanter is able to detect and manipulate the hidden energies of the world, drawing raw potential into people and objects. Be by carefully managing this power, she can bestow great advantages upon herself and her allies, but the wrong enchantments at the wrong time can have disastrous consequences. So the enchanter must keep a tight hold on her spells to be effective. That's number two. Okay. Maybe we'll draw eight. I think we're going to draw eight characters. We're going to end up with four, right? So we'll draw two, two, two. So that's our first two, the Paragon and the Enchanter. Uh, next up, um, the Wind Dancer. And this is a favorite of some. Okay, I've played this character a few times. So this wouldn't be top of my list, guys. But if that's what you want me to play, then, then fine. Uh, wind Dancer. Great power often lies uh, in which is unseen. The Wind Dancer has learned to trust the winds. Riding the gusts uh, and floating in, floating on the breeze... The wind is strong and flexible, but fickle, granting many boons, but not necessarily those of the wind dancer's choosing. With her fates tied to the in invisible currents, she must anticipate the bends and backdrafts to harness her power. Okay, that's the wind dancer. Okay, and again, if you know these characters, great. Choose the ones that you think would be the most fun. Also, try and get me balanced out so that we're not uh, having a, an imbalanced group of characters, which is fine. I don't care. That would make it more interesting. Uh, the knight, okay, much like, not like the paragon, really, because this, this person is like a fighter. The knight is a devout warrior capable of great feats of strength, high grace, and many offensive powers allow the knight to stay in a fight longer than any other heroes and make her especially well-suited to scouring blights from the land. That's a good character to have. Uh, the, knight's, the knight derives strength from her vows and is excellent at single-minded pursuit of an important task. A great character of the night. One of the originals, I believe. I don't remember if that was an expansion character or not, but I, I lost track. Uh, the Shaman. Okay, well, we all know what Shamans are like. The Shaman is a learned guide who can see and alter the spirit world. By balancing and cultivating dedicated, or delicate uh, spiritual energies, she can access strength, health, and good fortune, turning events subtly to her favor. Her spirit totem totems can be invoked to a sudden and spectacular effect even from a great distance but only after diligent preparation yeah she's an interesting one to play um, again i've played a number of these I'm, i was hoping to get some that i don't play 
Um, the Exorcist. This is another neat one. The Exorcist has made it his life's work to seek out and destroy evil. Though not adept at conventional forms of combat, he excels in spiritual battles, shielding himself with holy energies and casting out the darkness. With many tools for destroying blights and his self-renewing boons, he will not rest until the land has been purified. Okay, we're at six now. That's six. We've got two more to go. Let's see uh, what the next one's going to be. All right. Let's see here. We got... The Crusader. Get a lot of fighters in this one. Wow. All right. Well, the Crusader is a mighty warrior, blessed and fortified by holy powers. Fearsome in battle and full of grace, the Crusader is often the swiftest and most effective hero for a task, especially for uh, scourging blights from the land. However, he, his dependence on supernatural assistance can cause him to quickly run out of grace, forcing him to retreat and recover before returning to the front lines. Grace is, you know, the power of gods that keeps you alive. So that is the Crusader. We're going to have one more. Let's see what we get. This is an odd bunch. I, this is going to be really fun, actually. I love it. And the Prince. Okay, really odd bunch of characters this time around. The Prince. The Prince is, is a great warrior in his own right, but he can sway the hearts and minds of people and ensure the land continues to resist the dark forces at work. He can establish a network of resistances across the kingdom and inspire others to continue fighting. However, the Prince draws attention everywhere he goes and will find it difficult to escape the notice of the necromancer. So those are our six characters. The rest are going away and you can see we, we didn't get a healer like the priest, a uh, tamer which is a, like a pet type character. The, way, the, the wayfarer is really good at helping you find your way. Ranger, also another druid, probably one of my favorite characters in the game. The nymph, not one of my favorites but it would have been interesting to play. Channeler, the mercenary, very good, good character. The Bard, all these characters are great. The Monk's one of my favorites. Uh, Tinker, very interesting character. The Rogue is another one of my favorites, basic game character favorites. Conjurer, uh, Scholar. As you can see, we, we had an Alchemist. Valkyrie is another really good one. The Acolyte, really good. He was actually an Acolyte of the Necromancer. So he's got a lot of dark powers that help him uh, fight the Necromancer directly. Seer uh, helps us see things, like see cards ahead and stuff like that. Scout, and then of course the almighty flame fireball throwing wizard but unfortunately that's what not those aren't the ones we got so we didn't get the wizard we didn't get that sort of thing going on but that's okay because we have some cool characters to play so now that you've seen them again it's the paragon the enchanter the wind dancer the knight the shaman the exorcist the crusader and the prince we're going to take four of them okay so tell me which four you want I think this, uh, I got you, I got the game kind of ready to go. Everything's out and we just need to get going at this point, right? So shuffled up all the decks. Everything's ready for us to play. I just need to know who we're going to play. So please chime in. Help me, uh, t tell me who we're going to play this uh, round. And uh, let's have some fun with some Darkest Night. And again, I, I can't promise you if this game strikes your fancy that you're going to be able to find it anywhere. But if you get the opportunity to get this game, especially this big second edition, deluxe second edition version of the game, I highly recommend it. It's on the in my top 10 uh, all time for me. For me, again, people are different. I do like, and I love the simple mechanics of this game that make it interesting. Get it's so deep. But anyway, we're going to enjoy it. So let's. So you tell me what we're going to do, who we're going to play, and then we're going to take those heroes and see if we can destroy the necromancer, and drive back the darkness. So take care. I'll talk to you in the next one. Hope you have a great day. I'll chat with you soon.